Excellent. Um, so this is a special panel. Uh, we talked previously about uh, our Vets Index's Employer Awards Program. Uh, this is a panel where uh, every organization on this panel uh, has received our five-star employer award, uh, our highest award level. Um, so, you know, really cream of the crop, uh, the best experts uh, to be speaking to this issue. And I'm particularly glad that we're talking about military spouses because I think too often, um, you know, military spouses kind of get forgotten or left behind in the veteran employment discussion. So, uh, you know, trying to correct that if we can. Um, and we have uh, a great uh, lineup of panelists uh, here. Um, so do me a favor, if you would, just to get things started, uh, just go down the line and uh, introduce yourselves. So I'm Josh Deason, a military recruiter for Southern Company. Uh, so we're an energy and utility provider, primarily in the Southeast, uh, based out of Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm a Army veteran. So. Good morning, Nikita Wallace, uh, Marine Corps veteran of 23 years. I work for Spectrum, better known as Charter Communications. Um, I am the military talent attraction manager for the company and the organization. We are in 41 states. Uh, we are the second largest telecommunications company in the continental US. Hi, Susan Christ. I am with Oracle. I am on the culture and inclusion team with Oracle. I'm a veterans program manager and also an Air Force veteran. Hi, my name is Jezebel Rivera. I'm the vice president of talent acquisition for Pfizer, financial technology company, and I support uh, recruitment efforts for corporate functions. Excellent. Um, so glad to have all of you here. Um, and I think, you know, with a lot of these discussions, the best place to start it off is the why, but not the why for, you know, military spouses who obviously we understand why uh, they care about jobs, why they need employments. Uh, but, you know, for everyone here, if you want to say we need to devote company resources to this initiative, you need to make a business case for why that will help your organization. Um, so I'll just toss this out as, uh, you know, please jump in. Uh, we don't have to go in order. Uh, but uh, what is the business case for hiring military spouses? How does that help your organization? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so I think, you know, when you think about the first career, right, vets have obviously have served in the military. A lot of them go on to become entrepreneurs um, along with their spouses. Uh, currently, 2.5 million vets own American businesses, and they employ about 6 million um, Americans as well. They bring in about over a trillion in revenue. So I think from a business case, it makes financial sense. Um, Pfizer supports uh, veteran and uh, small businesses in the community. Um, we process all of their transactions through some of our products and solutions. Um, so I think for us, it's not just the right thing to do, but it definitely makes a, a business, um, you know, financial reason to it. I think that we have to take into consideration what military spouses bring to the table. They bring resilience, they bring excellent problem solving abilities, and they represent very well um, in our veterans programming. We um, have an internship where we welcome 40 veterans and military spouses a year. Our current cohort has more than half military spouses, and they are leaders in the program and become leaders with Oracle um, because of the things that, the attributes that they bring to the table. I think for us, it's really simple. Um, it's the untapped market of tier one talent that brings a lot of intangible traits and qualities to the table. And we should try to hire more military spouses to come on board. And I want to say one thing that I noticed was, um, you know, military spouses tend to primarily be in a support role. You know, they're, they're adults, they're, they're supporting their spouse all the time who's, you know, serving the country. So what I found is that if you can give a meaningful career to military spouse, they're not going to go anywhere. Like they're going to hold on to that. That's that's theirs now. They have their own thing, and, and it gives that sense of purpose and their contribution to your organization too. Excellent. Um, so you know, let's say uh, you've got leadership bought in. They're ready to pull the trigger. They're looking for military spouses to hire. Where do you go? Where have you guys found is the best resource or the best resources to uh, you know kind of identify and attract uh, top quality military spouse talent? 
So I, Pfizer, we partner with a lot of different organizations in the military community. Um, we've had a really strong partnership with Hiring Our Heroes, where we uh, bring in fellows uh, into the company, as well as 50 Strong. So I think we do a lot of initiatives um, to not only attract vets, but also their spouses. Um, and we have a very strong support system as far as our, you know, our champion uh, efforts from the top. So. We actually um, partner quite closely with Military Spouse Employment Partnership, which is a DOD program. I actually, before joining Oracle, was part of that program. Um, and they, they have the ability to reach out to every um, installation in the world. Um, so we send our jobs through them. They reach out to every installation in the world, to employment and transition professionals at every installation, and um, advertise our jobs for us. So that is a, a, an invaluable resource and where we find most of our talent in military spouse land. Yeah, I'd say for Spectrum, it's mostly at our enhanced recruiting events, obviously to hire our heroes and some of the recruit militaries, MSEP as well. Uh, we actually have six military spouses that we actually found at those events, meaning the Hiring Our Heroes, that went through the fellowship program too as well. So that's traditionally where we find most of our tier one talent for those military spouses. Yeah, I mean, we, we use MSEP a lot as well. Um, and that, that's, that's a phenomenal program. Um, and they can really plug you in uh, to any installation you want. So, you know, if, if, you're, if you're having trouble finding a contact in a, in a POC, uh, at a military installation, the, the MSEP program is great. And they can actually open those doors for you as well. Um, and so that, and then we'll go visit those installations and meet with those spouses, um, either at career fairs or go have like an office day somewhere. And that's where we get that one-on-one -on -one interaction with them. Excellent. And I'm so glad that, uh, you guys uh, talk so much about MSEP because, you know, it's so critical to this. And, you know, Susan, you have kind of a unique perspective uh, having been on both sides. Um, so if you would, uh, starting with Susan and, um, you know, the rest of you, please uh, join in as well. Um, for folks who may not be as familiar with MSEP, maybe they're just kind of brand new to the space, talk a little bit more about kind of all the most important functions that MSEP fulfills and, uh, you know, really what, what MSEP can do to help you as an employer looking for military spouse talent. Absolutely. MSEP is part of a larger program um, with DOD called the Spouse Education and Career Opportunities Program. And they provide a plethora of resources for spouses, including career counseling, resume development, um, and training now. Um, so the ability to tap into that market through MSEP is absolutely invaluable. And as I mentioned, they have connections with every installation in the world. So um, if you have a need in a particular area and with a particular um, installation, you can definitely reach out and utilize that program. It is free for employers to take advantage of that as well. Anybody else want to talk about kind of your experience working with MSEP? I mean, we, we, I, like to, I like to make sure like if I know that a military spouse applies for a position because, you know, typically on our, you know, in the ATS, you know, they apply for a position. We don't know they're there. Uh, we don't know they've applied for a position. They're in a sea of 150 other applications. Um, so what I've found is that if I have uh, like an MSEP partner on an installation, um, a lot of times they'll actually send me an email or a note um, and just say, hey, I've got a military spouse that's applying for a position with you. So I can actually put eyes on that, uh, maybe link it with the recruiter, see if it's a good fit. Um, but you kind of get that more personal touch because your MSEP partners are really like looking out for it and they're going to reach out to you and let you know if they can, if like if someone's applying for your company too. And I think for us at Spectrum, a lot of our um, NSEP partnership has to do with a lot of virtual career fairs, um, where we've gotten some tier one talent from that too as well. But most importantly, is just connecting them with those additional resources out there to help them get hired and on board with the company. Excellent. Um, and Josh, I'm so glad you brought up, um, you know, kind of the challenge of identifying military spouses, you know, both when they're coming in uh, as applicants, um, but also even the existing military spouses who are already in your uh, you know, organization who you may or may not realize are military spouses. Talk to me, if you would, about kind of the challenge of identifying military spouses, both, you know, when you're getting the applications uh, and also the self-identification challenge for your existing employee population. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've found it to be challenging, um, you know, because even, even a lot of veterans don't want to self-identify, you know, for one reason or another. So, I mean, it's it's a challenge to get people to do that. I mean, sometimes they don't understand why we're doing it. Um, and sometimes we're just want to make sure that if we have specific benefits that are available to them, that we can actually steer them in the right direction. Um, you know, we don't have to give you a lapel pin to wear or something, you know, if you don't want to do that. It's just, we just want to know that you're out there uh, so we can provide you resources. Um, 
For military spouses, I think a lot of times it's, it's a little bit of fear in the application process because they're applying for a job and they're basically telling their employer, we're probably gonna have to move. Like my, my spouse is a service member, we're not gonna be here for a long time. So it's not a remote position. You know, they're gonna have a little bit of pullback and they don't wanna identify that. Um, I have found that once they're on board for military spouses, then they're okay. Like it's like once they're in there and they feel comfortable and they feel like they got their groove, then they'll come and they'll talk to you. They'll come and participate with us in events and things like that. Um, but I think you just have to get over that. Like we understand like you're a military spouse. And I, I just think you really have to, like when I do those one-on-one -on -one contacts with them in the application process, I'm letting them know we know who you are, you know, and I'm a veteran. I understand what you do and what you've done and what your spouse does. Um, and that's okay. And we're here to support you. And we want to hire you because of what you can bring to the organization. So I think you have to break down some of those barriers, but I think it starts with that application process. Yeah. At Pfizer, we have a really nice vet edge policy that we implemented. Um, and, you know, during the application process, candidates um, would answer one of the qualifying questions. Are you a military vet or a spouse? Um, and we actually, um, you know, have asterisks and, and points um, if they all identify as that. And it helps our recruiters make sure that we target those applicants um, as we select, um, you know, them for interviews. Um, so it's something that we really promote, um, you know, early on in the process. We talk to the candidates, the hiring managers, um, and if all things being equal, we really want to promote that hire for that military uh, vet or spouse. Um, and then when we talk about the self-identification process, that's something that we cover a lot of the times through onboarding, where we really encourage our new hires to self-identify if they're comfortable um, via, you know, our um, HRIS system. And that's really important to really just identify gaps within the organization of where we need to do better at. Um, so that, that's something that we really uh, believe in and advocate for. Absolutely, it is such a challenge to get military spouses to self-identify. They are, like you mentioned, afraid of that stigma of I'm gonna have to leave. Um, so one of the things that we do in the recruitment process is try to identify them um, as best we can. And utilizing MSEP and other organizations that target military spouses helps us to identify them as they come in as applicants. As far as identifying um, when they're with us, we have a very strong and active employee resource group for veterans and military affiliated um, family members uh, within Oracle. And that really assists us greatly in self-identification for military spouses. I think for us, uh, when it comes to the military spouses, no, they may not always self-identify on the front end, um, but when they do, in fact, self-identify, we try to connect them with some of the military spouses that are currently working on my team. Um, so they'll have someone to kind of match and mirror it and share some opportunities and some concerns, because we do realize it's really tough for them to kind of make a decision on, you know, should I apply? Are we rotating? Are we going to PCS? So those are some of the concerns that are out there. But we do what we can to make sure that we connect with those military spouses to make them feel comfortable. And just like you said, you know, we have the BRG that's out there, whether it's the veterans BRG or the women's BRG, we want to make sure they have a home within the company and the organization so they can kind of, you know, cross pollinate and share some of those questions and concerns they may have. Yeah, excellent. I love what you said about, um, you know, kind of the various uh, re business resource groups working together and collaborating and, you know, kind of making a network of business resource groups uh, where, you know, they can share information, resources, what's worked, what hasn't, really valuable stuff. Um, a couple of you have uh, kind of started to tread on this ground and I think it is important um, for us to kind of cover what the unique challenges are that military spouses uh, will face in their careers. Um, you know, we've started to talk about this uh, a little bit, but I think it's good to kind of take it head on, and in particular, from the company's perspective and from the recruiter's perspective, um, you know, things like being alarmed at seeing, you know, a lot of job changes or resume gaps, um, you know, just kind of talk through the challenges that military spouses uh, are more likely to face in their careers and in their job searches, and what each of your organizations tries to do to kind of get over what may be for a non-military spouse applicant a hurdle, uh, you know, when looking at their resume? Um, I think, um, you know, in just kind of a, a real life story, um, I interviewed a candidate uh, recently, very recently, um, and when I was looking at her resume and talking through her background, there were some gaps on there. Um, and it was just, you know, I just needed to ask. 
Um, and she was very vulnerable and, and answered the questions. She got emotional um, and she shared some of her, you know, life story and a little bit about what happened through some of those periods. Um, and just an open, honest conversation and something I appreciated and valued. And that's something that we value at Pfizer. Um, so just being able to speak and, and having, you know, those uncomfortable conversations sometimes, um, I think is, is welcoming and, and something that we, you know, try to apply every phone screen. Um, and once, you know, we have an associate that has some of those struggles, whether it's a relocation um, that their spouse faces, we work very hard to make sure that they can hopefully find a home within the company, um, you know, via another state, or we also have partners in other organizations that we work with that will provide recommendations or referrals to. Um, I can say for me, we just lost one of my military spouses. Her husband came down on orders, so she had to make a command decision. Did she want to stay, um, do the geo bachelor thing while her husband went overseas to Korea? Uh, she decided to go to Korea, um, which is tough for her because now she's concerned about finding opportunities there. We don't have opportunities that are overseas, so there was nothing I could really do for her except connect her with some of the other resources that are available you know, avoid those military bases. So it's just a fact of life. With the military spouses, they're gonna transition, whether they're trailing or leading, whichever you prefer. I mean, it's gonna be a really hard obstacle for them to overcome those gaps in their resumes. But as long as they speak to it open and honestly, I think they'll have a, you know, a better opportunity to connect with an employee that's gonna understand their needs and hire them and onboard them to that company. Absolutely, and military spouses face another challenge with networking and the, the lack of a professional network that they've been able to build because they've been moving so much um, and they have gaps in their employments. Um, so the way that we address that is just being available through partnerships, through job fairs, through events, through networking um, to make sure that they have the ability to build their network. And then that also translates um, to our ERG and our mentorship programs within Oracle as well. Yeah, I think it's important if, if, if you're gonna be intentional about you know, military hiring in general. Um, so you're talking transitioning service members, veterans and military spouses as well. They really need, especially military spouses in this instance, they need an advocate inside the organization. Um, and you know, me being a military recruiter, that's all I focus on. And so if I know military spouse applied, I can go to a recruiter and say, here's why there's gaps. Here's why this spouse is moving around. This is why they've moved every two to three years. Because if the recruiter's not a veteran, it's never served, they don't understand. And that you get that whole job hopping, you know, stigma that they want to put out there on people. And you're like, that's that's not the case. Like this person didn't have a choice. You know, this person's moving to be with the family or whatever. So um, I just think it's important. I mean, you've, you've got to have someone that's not only an, an advocate within the organization, but that person also has to be hands on with them and make sure that they take care of that application and explain why those gaps are there. That is so important. The need for internal advocates, um, you know, kind of translating everything and, uh, you know, hopefully with, uh, you know, uh, the ear of leadership uh, who's willing to kind of put some force and perhaps budget uh, behind uh, these efforts. Um, so, you know, we've talked uh, about, um, you know, the challenges of uh, when you PCS and, you know, have to move across the country, across the world. Um, and, you know, in the pre-COVID days, uh, I think the circumstances were a little different with that uh, than they are now. I think uh, with COVID, it's been kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, there was the giant rise of remote and flexible working that uh, came with COVID. And we, at this point, have seen a lot of that kind of change and go in the other direction. A lot of, uh, you know, return to office proposals. Um, so, you know, kind of Looking at the broad scope of where we are now versus where we were during COVID versus where we were pre-COVID, um, do you think that there's in the employment marketplace uh, kind of a little more understanding, a little more flexibility and willingness to, uh, you know, open up uh, flexible working, remote working, uh, maybe flexible scheduling opportunities uh, for military spouses um, that, you know, maybe perhaps COVID kind of demonstrated a lot of these roles can be done remotely. You know, let's try to find more opportunities for military spouses, or perhaps has the you know backlash to uh, work from home, um, you know, maybe had some negative implications for military spouses. I can see it going either way. What, what do you all think? I can say for me, I have six military spouses. I can say for me, I have six military spouses that work on my team, and they're all remote. 
but that's my team. They're a niche role, this military talent attraction team. Uh, they, they work at, you know, C, six key installations that are out there right now. Um, but, you know, there may be opportunities with other companies and organizations to work fully remote. But as of now with Spectrum, we don't offer that opportunity right now um, to work fully remote within our company organization. However, we do have military spouses that work for the company. They have trailed their, their spouse that's on active duty. And we have assisted those individuals with transitioning from one location to another, as long as it's in, within our 41 state footprint. So. Oracle has an abundance of remote work opportunities. And just to give you an example, with our Oracle Veteran Internship Program, which also um, is open to spouses, right now we have 13 out of our 20-person cohorts um, who are military spouses. And out of those positions that they are in, um, only two of them are not remote. So um, there are pathways and opportunities within Oracle to um, find remote work and to be supported in that way. Yeah, I think for us, um, similar, I guess, to Spectrum, we um, are an on-site company, but we have offices worldwide, um, and there are pockets within each department that you might have that flexibility to work remotely, um, but when we don't, you know, we really try to make an effort to see if we can transfer the spouse, um, to see if there's any, you know, options or arrangements that we can, you know, work on them with. Excellent. Were you? Okay. Um, so, uh, heads up uh, that we are nearing the end of the panel and we have reserved the last, uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes or so uh, for questions. So, uh, if you have any questions in mind, uh, I'm about to ask kind of my last question for the panel and uh, then we'll open it up to all of you. We'll have a mic runner uh, coming around and also for our online attendees, uh, please, uh, you should have a way to enter uh, questions into our online platform. Uh, we will try to get those in as well. Um, so feel free to start submitting those right now. Um, first though, uh, I wanna kind of wrap up my questions here, um, asking uh, about what additional resources you would recommend uh, the folks in this room, uh, you know, take advantage of uh, what you've found most helpful uh, in uh, the military spouse area. We've talked a lot about MSEP. Uh, obviously, uh, that is probably should be uh, stop number one. Uh, but are there some other resources that uh, you know may be overlooked, uh, but you found particularly helpful? So military spouses talk to each other, right? Um, and one of the best resources that I have for recruiting military spouses is just through social media. Um, every installation has a spouse group on Facebook. Um, on LinkedIn um, that you can reach out through. And that is where I do a lot of my recruiting um, because they do talk to each other. It's a very word of mouth oriented group. Yeah, I think it's for us um, a lot of networking opportunities that we have. So whether virtual or on site, um, our head of CSR, um, her favorite phrase to use is your network is your net worth. Um, and I think the military community has a, a very large network. So we really try to you know, promote that and see where we can find opportunities for folks. I think for me, it's just participating in those enhanced recruiting events all over again, um, whether it's through Hunter Heroes, Recruit Military, MSEP, just participating, being present, connecting with them face-to-face, -face, having that conversation, giving them balanced feedback on their resume, and then making a connection from there with those, those individual spouses. Yeah, I, was, I was really glad that um, everyone went back to in-person and on-site career fairs and everything, and everything kind of steered away from that virtual option, uh, made it more personal. Uh, so when I meet military spouses on an installation uh, somewhere, it's just it's a lot more meaningful for that. Um, but, you know, you also have the uh, Career Accelerator Program now for military spouses, which kind of runs like DOD Skill Bridge, but for spouses, um, and they can actually intern with your organization um, as well. So that's, that's kind of a newer um a newer tool you can use to kind of get on those lists and they'll send you a list of them. Um, just like, you know, you get cohort lists and all that from if you use hiring our heroes or something like that. Uh, but they also have that for spouses as well. So you can actually intern military spouses at your company too. Excellent, fantastic. Um, so I'd like to open it up for questions now. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please just raise your hand and we should hopefully have a mic runner coming around soon. How y'all doing? Oli from USA. I just got a question relative to um, maybe policy related. Uh, so some of the challenges we have, we're not, we are overseas. 
we are overseas, but um, but it's very restrictive on where we are. With the return office and everything that a lot of companies have gone through, have y'all seen similar impacts? Uh, or have you modified any of your policies related to active duty, primarily active duty military spouses that have PCS? I can say we haven't modified any policies whatsoever. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, Obi, but we haven't modified any policies whatsoever when it comes to return to office um, for military spouses. It's been the same process throughout. Um, obviously, during COVID, you know, we had a hybrid role at some point in time. Then we started coming back into the office full time. So it keeps dying, but no, we hadn't changed any policies whatsoever. Hi, does this work? Okay, I'm Angela from Merck, and we have a, a very robust veteran leadership network group in our company. And one of the areas that we've seen as a weakness is the spouse and family support. I'm a spouse, my husband's a retired Marine. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we're trying to figure out is we have the same issues you have is how do you identify the spouses? It's all very confidential at the HR level, so if you're not part of the HR team, you're not really allowed to know. So how do we get people to engage with us has been an issue we've had. One of the things I wanted to ask the, the panel is that I know you're all in the hiring position, but for the groups that you have in your companies that do reach out to these family spouses, how do you encourage, what, what kind of activities do you engage in that help bring those spouses forward? So from an EBRG perspective. Yeah, I, I can tell you now. So when a military spouse um, participates in an in-person or virtual career fair, post-event, I send on a campaign message mm -hmm. where they can set up an office hours, meaning a 25 minute phone call with our team. They'll have a conversation with us, provided he or she has applied for a role and they're qualified for it. We do up a narrative for each and every one of them and we send it over to the individual recruiters. So we highlight those skill sets and we do answer the mail in regards to those gaps too as well in their resume. So, so we, what about the employer, the employees that you already have? The ones that we currently have. So we have, I'm um, just to give you a history. We have a very large, like over a thousand veterans at Merck. Okay. And all of them have spouses for the most part, yeah. or they have families and members that they want to bring in. How do we get the people that are already there? So that's what I'm interested in because we have, we're, we're working on the recruiting piece like you've done as well. Although I do like this MSEPS organization. I think we'll try to tap into that as well for, as we're bringing people in, but it's hard to get people to speak up. And a couple of them are afraid because their service members are deployed and they're not sure if they're allowed to say that they're a service member's wife or, or husband. Um, but how do you get the ones that are already there who are not the target audience you're reaching for at this point because you've already hired them. So they're not part of the how do we hire them and bring them in. It's what do we do with them now that we have them. And I think that's, yeah, I think that's a part of the BRGs. Sorry. That are, oh, I'm sorry. I think that's a part of the BRGs too as well. They're going to connect with those individuals and encourage them to be a part of the veterans BRG within the company. Also the women's BRG too as well. So they're going to encourage those individuals to speak up, um, update their people soft, let them know that, you know, they're a veteran or a military spouse within the company and the organization. So I think it starts there with the BRG too as well, which is still a small group. You know, uh, we have, you know, about 8.2% or 8,200 veterans that are within the company and the organization. Not all of them are part of the BRG, but there are some that are within there uh, that may want to connect with other male spouses within the company and organization to encourage them to come on board too as well uh, and be a part of that program. So, and, and just share some of their questions or concerns about, you know, where they are in that space as far as the organization too as well. I think too, our veteran employee network at, Oracle is not called a veterans ERG. It is our military affiliated and veteran employee resource group. So um, the focus is expanded. There are opportunities for mentorship and we match military spouse to military spouse for mentorship. Um, in addition to that, there is a Slack channel just for military spouses that's available um, on, our, on our Slack network as well. Yeah, we, we partnered with um... So we have, uh, you know, our, our veterans ERG group, and we actually partnered with one that's um, primarily for for females. Um, and we actually hosted a luncheon uh, that was kind of close to like Veterans Day and all that. And we actually had an all female panel uh, for that. Um, it was like a women's giving luncheon kind of thing. And so, um, and so that panel was comprised of like uh, female veterans and also military spouses. 
Um, and I think it was big because then we found out we actually had military spouses in the audience that came to the event um, that we didn't know were military spouses. Um, even if I knew the employee, I was like, I did not, I had no idea you were a military spouse. Like, nope, you know, what, this is amazing. Um, and so I think having those events and then advertising those events, like you're, it's cool to have an ERG, but it, it needs to be active and it needs to be in front of the employee so they know that it, that it exists. And I think if you can partner up like we did, we actually brought a couple of the ERGs together. Like, like let's, let's see if we can get in front of a broader audience um, and see if we can get more people to participate that way. Uh, so just picking up on Oli's question on regards to PCSing, um, do any of your companies offer intentional benefits or time off around that time that the student person has to travel? And my previous company, I think of the uh, female spouse, she was PCSing from Germany back to Texas, um, but had to take personal time off and vacation time to kind of fit that bill. And then the second part of the question is, and we've already started talking about it, um, when she lands in Texas, right, there's no network or anybody around her in that community to get reconnected into that community. So does your ERG to ERG assist or is there a broader network that I'm not aware of that helps uh, spouses reconnect into those communities? So is there a policy for time off and then how do you re-engage them in that I know person. Right now, we, we do not have a policy for time off, but as far as re-engaging, um, I, I would hope that they know who we are as a team, as an organization, and they traditionally they will connect with the military talent attraction team, and then we'll connect them with local um, um, sponsors for the the location that they're transitioning to. Hi, thank you very much for uh, your comments and questions. Uh, I'm John Lees from uh, Circo. A comment and a question. So, uh, for the group, the upcoming Military Spouse Appreciation Day. Uh, is just a fantastic opportunity for companies to kind of get behind, to build up that presence to your ERGs and, and maybe bring some folks out of the fold, in addition to the males who are military spouses as well, right? You gotta remember that. Uh, my question for anybody up there, for Military Spouse Appreciation Day, do you do anything um, spectacular? Is there any any takeaways that you've done before either at the company you're at or previous companies or something that you've seen that you could share with a group that we could potentially use in our, our planning processes? I don't think that's something that we explored yet, um, but I think we're always looking for opportunities to see where, you know, we can have um, some synergy around some of the events and celebrations, but it's definitely something that we want to look into. So our ERG recognizes Military Appreciation Month and Military Spouse Appreciation Day with a series of events, including keynote speakers, including physical fitness challenges, including um, ways that they can give back to the community by partnering with nonprofits. Um, so yes, we do recognize it. Yes, it is something that is important on our agenda for our ERG. We do as well, we do recognize it. It is a part of the, uh, the Veterans BRG um, communication plan uh, to connect with those military spouses too as well. Uh, but traditionally it's virtual, unless it's around a center of influence, they may have something in person, uh, but I know that they do have a communication plan that goes out where they have something uh, virtually where they celebrate those military spouses too. Good morning, my name is Josh Lopez. I'm from Nine Line Veteran Services, and I guess my real question with your recruitment with uh, military spouses is, do you target cert certain areas? And I'm talking like urban, suburban, or rural areas, and how do you engage with them? I guess when you say certain areas, are you referring to key installations that are out there where you have the most transitioning service members that was presented on this slide before, or? Uh, I apologize. Uh, yeah. It's a mixture of both, right? So my organization, we not only are in TAP trying to engage with the transitioning, but we also go out to rural areas to best serve active duty veterans and their families. Mm -hmm. And so I was just curious to know if you're with everything that you do and engaging with those uh, military spouses, um, is it just specifically in urban and suburban areas or do you go straight or is it wherever? 
it's, it's mainly, I would say, definitely around there's five key installations out there that I have some military spouses on, but essentially within our footprint. So if it's within our footprint, we're connecting with those individuals about opportunities here at Spectrum. And that's one of the most beautiful things about the virtual side of the house. If they are located in a rural area, they can still participate in a robust, you know, uh, career fair and connect with us, you know, whether it's during the event or post event. And I think remote opportunities really are key for military spouses, especially those who are in rural areas. So being able to provide those employment opportunities that are remote is key for that. Um, we do work with we do work with um, several veterans. The majority of my caseload is actually um, dependents, children mostly. And um, in keeping with that word, and families, I'm wondering if you have any. Um, I know you mentioned the the work that you do with ERGs. I'm wondering if you have any talent acquisition strategies for um, military children. I would say no, we don't have one specifically for military children, but it's not to say that I haven't seen individual dependents, which my wife hates that terminology, um, come to an actual career fair and connect with us about opportunities too as well. Yeah, we have um, different activities, um, not particular to, to military children, but obviously to children, and we definitely encourage that. So we have a really nice after school um, FinTechy future program that we offer to STEAM students. Um, you know, middle school uh, age within the community. You just want my microphone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for being on the panel. So for military spouses, uh, for service members, there's reemployment rights, right? So I can I can come out of high school, have a good job, decide I want to go in the military, and I can come back to that same job after my enlisted is done. For guard members, they can get deployed, they can come back, their job's pretty much guaranteed. Uh, do you voluntarily offer reemployment rights for military spouses, or do you think there would be a benefit for a, a regulation or a requirement for reemployment rights for military spouses? I think you could. Um... I mean, I think just, you know, first and foremost, having the internal movement ability um, to let them know that they can't transfer um, across your organization is, is really important. Um, but I would I would I would say that I, that's probably a really good idea to look into something like that to just something else you can take off that that plate of stress that they've already got um, around what their life looks like. So I, I think that's a good point. So you can look into. I mean, I think back. I, I'm, I mean, I just offered one of my military spouses. Um, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, I documented that she's, you know, eligible to come back with the company and the organization um, and to obviously reach out to us if she's back in footprint too as well. But currently right now, there's, you know, I think it would be something great to have a reemployment right for military spouses. Um, but, you know, obviously that's going to have to change with policy within that company and organization. So that's a really huge ask. Um, but I'd love to see that happen for the military spouses. Once again, I'm, I'm biased. I mean, I was a dependent on active duty and then, you know, retired as a Marine and was married. So, you know, I, I think that would be a great opportunity for those, you know, companies to put that in place. So. Yeah, I don't think we have a policy, but again, it's the right thing to do. Um, so I think that's the policy that we adopt. So if we have someone that's re, you know, interested in rejoining the organization and that's the story of why they left, why not? Um, So I think that's just something that we instill in in part of our value system. Excellent. That's so great. I absolutely love, you know, discussions like this that open up new ideas, just, you know, collaboration. That's exactly what we're about here. Um, It is just about time for us to wrap up this panel. Unfortunately, time flies when you're having fun. Uh, Our next panel uh, won't start for another 20 minutes. It starts at 1035. Uh, That is going to be a great panel you won't want to miss uh, about a pipeline for veteran talent that I think is too often overlooked. One of the best uh, benefits of serving in the military is the GI Bill. So if you want to find great military talent, I think too often organizations are looking for people coming directly out of the military when a lot of your great veteran talent 
might actually be in colleges and universities. So we'll have a lot more to talk about on that uh, at the next panel. That'll start at 1035. Uh, until then, we are going to be uh, in our morning break and networking session uh, in the room immediately behind us. Uh, so thank you all very much. Thank you.